I'm going to make a generalization here. And when I say generalization, I mean I'm going to be at least partially wrong. Mechanically, movement is driven in the human body from the bottom up. Neurologically, however, movement is driven from the top down. Let me give a few examples to, ex to explain why that works. So, when it comes to the human body, when it comes to bearing weight in particular, and dealing with gravity, understand that as we go from top to bottom, the lower structures will be bearing more weight most of the time, especially in a standing position, because they take on the entire weight of the human body above it. And so they must be constructed in such a way, and they must be capable of dealing with that constant pressurization of those lower joints and lower bones. So for instance, we often have a concave structure and a convex structure. In the ankle here, you can see how the talus, the technical term for lower ankle bone, is convex, and the tib, fib, tibia, fibia is concave. One fits into the other nice and snug. It's designed to do that. We have the same relationship, in fact, a biconcave relationship as we look at the knee. And so this makes sure that even under, under a great deal of pressure, they fit together nicely. And this prevents a lot of side shifting, a lot of wobbling. And this follows all the way up, all the way up into the hip, and into the pelvis, even into the sacrum, and throughout the spine. It allows for this weight bearing under pressure, maintaining a certain position because it is shaped to do so. Now, alternatively, this can be a problem, this stacking nature to things. So let's say, for instance, we take that foot and we drift it outwards. We, we really externally rotate it. This will mean that the weight borne by the body on this particular side in this particular example will be side shifted as well. So that tibia and its position will be now offset, meaning the femur also has to compensate. That concave convex relationship, of course, must be adjusted. And this will often drive one side of the pelvis down. We'll see one low side and one high side. So an unleveling, if you will. And this has to be the case because of the fact that the weight stacked above it will encourage this to happen. It can be good in certain ranges, it can be bad in other ranges. Now, let's talk about something slightly different. Neurologically, we have some important control centers, and most of it is actually built around the eye line remaining level. So if the eye line is approximately here, it wants to remain level at all times because it wants to see the horizon. We also, further to this, have a vestibular system, the inner ear, and they monitor velocity in our head and make sure it's constantly reporting back to the vestibular coordinating apparatuses, brainstem. And this means it's aware of the position of the head and it compares it to what the eyes see and the level horizon. And it wants to maintain that essentially so we don't fall over. It's a very sensical system, in fact. And so it's doing this constantly. Now it will actually run its control through the nervous system all the way down, all the way through the spinal cord, and it will constantly be, be communicating. It will then adjust to maintain that eye line. It will adjust any joint position through muscular pull. So let's say, for instance, we've got an unlevel eye line now. We've taken this eye line and now we've, we've side shifted. We can't maintain this and expect to stay upright. The head is off center. The head is in a position it, it should not be. It's now positioned like this. So we need to find a way to pull it straight. It's stuck like this, for instance. We need to find a way to pull it straight. So the nerves, the nervous system, the peripheral nerves, will start to use muscles to pull the body into the correct position. So let's say we've got lower trapezius fibers, perhaps, 
We've got lots of other functions. We could say the, the traps could even, uh, traps and lats could work together in this case to correct the position, ultimately offsetting the shoulder girdle, ultimately re-leveling the head, even the though the body is technically unbalanced. We could see the same effect, of course, right into the pelvis as well, if we can't do the shoulders, and in fact, we might do both, in fact, both pelvis and shoulders, we could pull on the pelvis in such a way that QL could contract or something to that effect, and lats could be engaged again. Um, erector spinae, of course, are, are an option, but ultimately, we can unlevel one structure in a strange way. We can unlevel one structure to level the eye line, and this is completely normal. It's completely hardwired, and essentially, everyone does it. So you may be thinking, you may conclude based on this, that it is actually the neurological system, the eye line, the position of the skull on the AAOA, the OAA joints. They are the more important of the structures. It's more important than weight bearing and stacking. And this is not a bad conclusion to come to. However, it's only partially right. So let's make a scenario. Let's say we've got that unlevel eye line. And I don't have the ability to move in the area that needs to compensate. So I want to bend. What I want to do to change that eye line is I want to put a bend through this area of the spine. However, the tissues on that area, whether it's a thracolumbar fascia or maybe the fascias that are in between the vertebrae, they do not allow for movement anymore. Maybe it's a surgical injury, maybe it's a traumatic injury, but now they no longer allow for bending. They won't do that anymore. So it means that this area does not move. What you have to understand, in fact, is that these tissues, these fascial tissues, once fibrosed, that's just the technical term, for when they become thickened and full of extra ECM and collagen fibers to reinforce tissue. Once they become in this state, it actually can take hundreds, if not a thousand pounds of pressure to get them to release. And you may in fact break the very bones that they attach to before you get that fascia to release. So this means that down here, this fascial structure can actually prevent the neurologic adjustment from that central nervous system up top. Even though it would seem like the nerves are more important, and certainly in a hierarchical system, yes they are, but the fascia, the joint position, can override the neurologic impulse. Now, let's forget about that for a second, and just understand that everything is constantly adapting. The reality is when one area doesn't want to move, the body will find other areas to go to, so it might start to bend an area higher up and maybe an area higher up above that. And in fact, this is constantly happening because nothing is moving perfectly. Over enough time, you acquire points of restriction throughout your body quite regularly. So maybe it's in the hip on the opposite side. Maybe it's in the knee on the opposite side after that. And then we can go down to the ankle and say there's restriction throughout the body. And even further to that, you do not look the same when you are born as you do when you're older. And not just in size, but gradually over time, the shape of your joints even change structurally. In fact, they are in constant flux and change. And so you may have one nice and even balanced side and one side that is shaped like a bit of a jagged edge for whatever reason. Maybe it's because you're using it differently. Maybe it's because you've had traumatic injuries or maybe it's just the way you've been standing for way too long, but you change constantly, even at a bony level, even at a level of cartilage and what seems like perfectly solid bony articular tissue. This is in constant flux, and it means the body is actually constantly adapting to this change. There is essentially a never-ending amount of movement. There is no perfect balance. In fact, it was never balanced in the first place, and it will never be balanced. So just to simplify, if possible, 
let's say you have that joint again, something that looks kind of like a knee joint, and it has lots of tissues all around it to reinforce it. It may have a fluid in the center just for fun, and it will have a pretty dense network of muscles that can pull on it, that can change its position, and it will have a number of receptors, a number of different points of communication, and they all go back at some point or another to the central nervous system, the CNS. And now remember, that joint and every single joint in the human body is taking on weight at all times. Even when you're laying down, there's still pressure being brought on it. So there's always pressure, and that pressure is descending, and that is constantly causing the joint to have to shift and stabilize and change position. And that means the next joints down the line are having to shift and stabilize and change the position. And ultimately, it means the eye line is constantly having to shift and stabilize and change position. And so that means that eye line sends signals down to the muscles to shift the joints and stabilize its eye line position. But it causes the constant cyclic loop that we call the central nervous system. Understand too, and this may hurt your brain, these nerves are just charging at a speed of about 100, give or take, meters per second. For those of you who don't know what a meter is, it's about three feet. And so that actually means if you are two meters tall, these nerve impulses could travel your entire body 50 times a second. It is literally faster than you can perceive because it is perception. And understand there are over a trillion potentially nerves in your entire body and so the feedback of this system is so incredibly fast and so incredibly massive that it is a constant state of motion in the body. A constant state of compensation and movement, a never-ending, wibbly, wobbly, bendy, wobbly, timey, wimey thing, hopefully at the reference. And so this is what actually helps to prove, it's not all of it, but it helps to prove the concept of tensegrity and dynamic motion in the human body. It proves that it is a moving structure at all times, and really that the human body is always moving one part off of every part. So even down to your little elbow, everything in the human body is attempting to compensate for it, and it is attempting to compensate for everything else. Nothing works in isolation. Nothing can be alone in the human body, and everything is adapting to everything else at all times. And really, it should be treated as such, as a tensegrity structure, as a entire unit of function. This has been Elge from Simple Lines Anatomy. I hope that made sense.